What's up, EWPPG? How y'all doing? What's going on, everybody? All right. This video is just something that, hey, very dear to my heart. Number one is talking about food. Number two is Cajun and Creole, gumbos, jambalayas, all that good cooking. As you know, I was raised in Beaumont, Texas, South Texas. Hey, Louisiana, all of that right there together, all this good food. And I have never really just been told exactly what's the difference between Creole and Cajun. You know, I know about a jambalaya and a gumbo. You know, the gumbo has the root. Jambalaya is more of a tomato sauce or whatever. But this video, you know, it's, I stumbled upon it and it really broke it down. This chef, you can tell he knows what he's talking about and he's eating a lot of good jambalaya and uh, gumbos in his day. So let's just check him out and see what he has to say. All right. Spend some time with me in my pots and pans. I'd like to talk to you about Louisiana cooking. Louisiana food is two things to me, it's Cajun and Creole. Two completely distinctive things that develop side by side over the years. Cajun food is, is country food and Creole food is city food. Creole food is a food of the city of New Orleans. And the, the cities had seven flags flown over it, which means seven countries owned it. And each time they left someone behind. Well, those people were normally influential people. That's why they stayed. So they would have big houses with lots of servants. The most important person in that house, because entertainment is always a part of Southern tradition. It's a part of business. It's just a part of everything that's the South, was the cook. And the cook would work for a Spanish family, they have to cook for their taste. They'd work for a French family, they'd have to cook to, for their taste. So the idea was that over the years, these dishes are parts of this thing that, that the cook did, worked, just developed into wonderful dishes of food, like shrimp creole and uh, so many other stuffed eggplant and stuffed melaton. But you can see trends of Spanish and you can see French influence and Italian influence in all these dishes. And they taught it to their sons and daughters to become cooks. And so that's the way Creole evolved. Cajun food is different. Cajun food was evolved by the people coming from Nova Scotia into Louisiana and isolating themselves right here in the swamps, in the bayous, and living off the land and making do with what they had. You know, making do with what you had. That's something our ancestors has, had, has done and had to do for hundreds of years. So I know I can relate to that. We're here in Acadiana Village to give you a feeling of old Louisiana. Uh, the food and the music was the most important things that the Cajuns had to live every day off of. I mean, this was our entertainment, this was our life. The best cook in the neighborhood was the most important person in the neighborhood and the musicians were what made it work. So, you know, guys, the cook, the best cook, the best, the person that fries the chicken best, makes the best greens, the macaroni, cheese, potato salad, they're still the most important people. Albeit there's a lot of people that say they can do it now. And it probably is. So this is where both of these kitchens or both of these kinds of cooking come from. If you came today to Louisiana and looked for them, it'd be very hard to find because they're only in the homes and not in the restaurants. So what we have today and what we're going to talk about, you and I, is Louisiana cooking, which is a combination of Cajun and Creole. One of my favorite dishes in the whole world is jambalaya. Jambalaya is one of those things that, that just, when you talk about it, just makes the juices run in my mouth. I mean, it's just <laughs> exciting to eat. And it's so simple. Oh, it just says, jambalaya was used when I was coming up. Mother would, we didn't have electricity, so we didn't have a refrigerator. We had an ice box where you'd put a chunk of ice in. And about the second or third day that you had leftovers, uh, in the box that start to get a little bit funny, a little bit tainted. It was still good to eat. And you had to eat everything because there wasn't a lot of food. But the, the mother would take all this stuff out of the ice box and put it all in the pot together. And it could be anything, almost anything that you can imagine she would put in a jambalaya. There was one thing that was in every one of them, and it was some kind of smoked meat. She'd put sausage in it or she'd put some kind of ham in it. The, the thing that made jambalaya distinctive is that it was a rice dish and it was just incredibly hot. I love to eat hot, I mean, till it makes you scalp itch and it makes you sweat, you know, and it just makes you just really excited about eating. <laughs> but we would take, she'd take whatever leftovers we had, put it in a pot, bring it up, make a good strong juice with it, and then put rice in and cook it. 
and the rice would make it bland out. Just wonderful tasting, and the rice would have had a lot of flavor. And that's, to me, when I think of jambalaya, what it is, you can put anything in it. doesn't matter. It can be seafood. It can be pork. It can be chicken. But what we have for you today and what we'd like to show you how to, to cook is a chicken jambalaya. And it has sausage in it, which we call on doing in Louisiana, which means, to me, a pork smoked sausage, and tasso, which is Cajun ham, the strips of pork that's just intensely seasoned. I mean, you just roll them in herbs and, I'm sorry, you roll them in spices and sugar and salt, and then you age it and smoke it until it's just really reeking with flavor and just overwhelming with a sweetness of smoke. And this is tasso. That sounds good. You combine those with rice and a wonderful stock, and you have this incredible dish, which we call jambalaya, which I just happen to have right here with me. I love doing this kind of television because you get to eat all the time. I mean, it's just wonderful. To, you know, the word jambalaya comes from three or four different words. It, 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 jumbo, which is the, the French call ham. They call it a jambo. Uh, so that's where the jumbo comes from. The, the ya, Y-A, comes from the African word for rice. And Allah, you know, the Cajuns, we always say Allah. So it's jambalaya. Ooh. Hmm. You know, cooking is a wonderful thing to do. And you should be creative. You should be yourself when you're cooking. And I'm going to tell you right now that I will never follow a recipe more than uh, a half a time or actually not at all. So don't expect me to follow my own recipes when I do this. Now, we're starting out with, with a good hot fire, and this would be a normal fire at home, and butter and onions. And we want to take the onions and brown them, as you see it's happening here. Now, the reason we're browning the onions is to give them dimensions and taste and texture. Now, these onions are actually getting sweet by browning. You're taking the sugar out of the onion and you're bringing it to the surface and you're making it brown. And I mean, this is not like dumping sugar in sweet, but this is a kind of sweetness that's going to make an ultimate difference in the taste. Now, we've added the tasso to it. And the tasso is a Cajun ham that has, uh, we literally take this ham and, and we take strips of pork and we roll it in sugar and salt and, and peppers and we age it and smoke it. And just, I mean, the, this is a highly seasoned a uh, lot of taste ham, but we're still increasing the taste by our cooking method. Now, we're browning the ham with the onions. Now, anybody who's ever had a piece of ham that's just been sliced off and eaten cold or that's been browned know the difference in the taste. When you brown it, mm -hmm. you just accent the taste of pork. I mean, you just make it taste wonderful. And this is what's happening here. Now we're adding onions again, and we're adding bell pepper and celery, which we in Cajun country call the holy trinity of Cajun and Creole cooking, the onions and bell pepper and celery. And we're going to add a little bit of tomato sauce to it. Now, at this step, what we've done is we've taken onions, we've put them in, and we've got the sweetness out of them, and now they're getting very soft, so we have a taste and a texture the first time we put the onions in. We added the tasso to start the flavor building, to start the dehydration of the pork and the browning of the pork and the collection of the juices on the bottom of the pot. Now we're adding a mixture of herbs and spices into it. And the second, onions, bell pepper, and celery, and tomatoes. And we're going to let this cook together. The reasoning behind this is just really simple. I'm trying to build the ultimate in taste, and I'm trying to build on the bottom of the pan a crust. And the crust is going to be a combination of all these juices. And the third thing that you that, that is absolute necessity to get food to taste the ultimate is to have these taste changes and the texture changes. I'm going to add the sausage to it. Adding the sausage at this point is, again, bringing another, another element into it. And we're going to re-add everything another time. Let's watch for a second. Isn't that beautiful? Looks delicious. This reminds now me of the my juices grandfather. are coming together. I mean, you can see it coming together. They're getting thick and things are browning and just really working. This is cut up raw chicken that we're adding to it because it's a chicken jambalaya. Now, you don't wanna just put the chicken. I wanna stop right here real quick. One thing I noticed, I always sear my chicken first, but he didn't do that. So I am definitely going to try 
the dish his way without searing the chicken, just to see how it comes out. Pick it in. We believe, I believe that you got to season everything every step of the way. And you've seen put seasoning meat, we didn't season, but when we put vegetables that wasn't seasoned, we added seasoning to it. We put unseasoned chicken and now we're adding seasoning to it. Now it's time to add the bay leaves, it's time to add the garlic, and we're approaching the, the final steps or we're approaching the conclusion of the dish. And what I mean by that is the conclusion of the taste, not the conclusion of the cooking, because we don't want to overcook the chicken. That's why we put it in so late. Uh, we want to let everything else get the maximum of taste, the maximum of ability to taste, and then add the chicken to it because you want the chicken to stay nice and moist and you don't want to cook it a long time. The juice from the chicken, the sausage, the tasso, and all the vegetables is now going to start collecting on the bottom. When you see the smoke coming up from the pan, it's evaporation is happening. When this evaporation happens, it leaves a sort of, uh, you can see it there, it, it leaves uh, uh, things to stick on the bottom. They're mm -hmm. like little pieces of uh, uh, almost, you call them dregs, but little pieces of goodness. And those things, when they brown, they're not only sweet and delicious and a combination, thundering combination of taste, but they're also thick. I mean, they have gelatin in it. There's no flour in this. There's no nothing to make this thick except the juices that are there in the bottom of the pot that evaporated and left this brown crust. And when you leave this brown crust on and you put water or stock in it, when it comes up, it comes up thick. Now for the last and final time, we're adding onions and bell pepper and celery. Now we have three times onions uh, in it. We have two times bell pepper and celery in it. And we have two different kinds of tomatoes. We added tomato sauce. Now we're adding uh, uh, fresh tomatoes. So you see, we've taken this very economical, very simple dish that we call jambalaya, and we've staged ingredients. We've put them in one at a time, and we've gotten the ultimate taste out of each one of these ingredients. Now we're going to bring them together with starch, and we're adding rice to it. Now rice is very, very bland, so we season the rice a little bit. But the the the, the real thing that's going to make the rice work and make this a valuable dish is all the juices that we've concentrated and that we've added stock to these juices and brought them up. Isn't that pretty? God, I can taste it. We brought them up and all this is going to get into the rice. And then the starch from the rice is going to get into the dish itself. And those combinations of bland and seasoning is going to just make this spectacular dish to eat. Looks good. Jambalaya. You hear it sticking on the bottom and getting that up from the bottom. The final time of getting the ultimate taste out of it. You got to scratch the bottom. I mean, that's where the goodness is. It sticks on the bottom. Finish adding the stock. I'm going to add just a few more tomatoes to it, also. And the onions and bell pepper that we've added the last time still got color to it. Now we're going to add a few tomatoes so the color will be there. Then we're going to cover it, let it simmer for a few moments. Time to eat. And you have jambalaya. Gumbo is the most historical dish in Louisiana. I think that it has That's it has facts. more meaning to me than anything else that I cook. Perhaps jambalaya has almost as much, but gumbo really does. When when we had problems with not enough food, mother made a gumbo. When we had 
uh, too many mouths to feed from company and, and the gumbo always made it work because gumbo is a sauce and it's rich and it tastes good and it satisfies your hunger. Um, I can remember the times when uh, I was growing up, my brothers and sisters were going to the dance. They would stop by the house on Saturday night and they would leave off their children. Mother and I babysat. <clears throat> One of the things we always did was fix a pot of gumbo because when they would come home at two or three o'clock in the morning. Real quick, you know, the key, and I watch the Food Network. I used to watch it a lot, but I still watch it, but not as much. When they were have those, you know, shows when they were trying to become the next uh, talk show host or whatever on their cooking show host, they would tell them the key to relating to your audience when you're cooking in your kitchen or, you know, especially if you have a show is to tell stories about your family. What made you want to cook this dish? What does, why does this, this inspire you? So, and that's what he's doing. He's making us relate to him as he goes into the history of gumbo. And I love gumbo. This makes me think about my gramps because honey, my grandfather taught me how to make gumbo, my mama's daddy, and he absolutely loved it. Morning, that would be something for them to eat. We had a wood-burning stove. We simply just pushed the gumbo in the back of the stove after it was made, and it was just spectacular. What you have with a gumbo, when you talk about cooking it, is you have a just spectacular multiple taste that's really unusual, especially if you don't know anything about Louisiana food. You take flour and oil, and you cook it to such an incredibly hot temperature. We're talking five, 600 degrees till the flour actually starts to brown. Then you season that flour and oil by putting onions and bell pepper and celery and mixed herbs and spices into it. Once that happens, you have the start. And we always say in Louisiana, first you make a roux. And that is what is the key to the gumbo. You're getting it the right color, you're getting it to the right taste. The next thing you gotta have is you got to either have a very old chicken or that old duck that's hollering over there. You got to have either one of those, and it got to be old because if it's when it's old, it's tough, and when it's tough, you got to cook it a long time, and it makes a wonderful juice. If you if you don't have that, and if you live in a city, you certainly don't have it. If you you got to have a wonderful stock, which is taking bones, uh, like you see us doing here, taking bones and browning them off really hard until they get good and golden brown and put them with water, bring them to a boil, and then let them simmer for hours and hours until you have a wonderful juice to cook with. Next thing you add is cooking expertise and That's right. bell peppers and onions and celery. And you, what comes out is this rich, rich tasting, wonderful broth. It's, it's a soup, but it's not a soup. It doesn't taste like any soup you've ever had. It's a gumbo and a gumbo has a special taste to it. And let me say this, gumbo is meant to be eaten with rice, not cornbread and crackers. That's if you know anything about a good, good, good show enough gumbo. I'm just saying, not knocking what nobody do, but a gumbo is meant to be eaten with rice, not crackers, bread, or cornbread. <laughs> All of Louisiana food we talk about has a framework of taste. And that framework of taste involves in cooking method, the brown roux. It involves in the seasoning, uh, red pepper, white pepper, black pepper, garlic, onions, bell pepper, celery, and the usage of those things. And so what we're doing is making a gumbo that tastes like you wouldn't believe. Now, I've I got some right here, but I'm going to tell you, I, I'm going to get ready for this one. I mean, I'm gonna just <laughs> His butt be right eating, baby. Yes, yes. <laughs> You know, I, I, I like to introduce dishes this way that, because it really makes my work hard. Mm -hmm. Oh, when you, it's, it's just, it's, it's just amazing to taste what you, what happens is the first thing you taste is that dark root. And then as you start to swallow, it, you get different tastes, the bell pepper, the onions that, it, that have been cooked a long time and it kind of sweet. And then you taste the chicken. And the chicken comes through really strong. Then when you swallow, you have this wonderful glow in your mouth. I mean, it, it's, Ooh, it it's like, me want a gumbo. It's like, <laughs> it's like almost pain, but it isn't. And, and it's, oh, it's fun. It's, it, I mean, it's, it's pleasure. I mean, it really is. And what happens today is you want to take another bite. And I mean, the, then the chicken comes through again, the sausage comes through, the smokiness from the sausage. Um, I think I'm going to quit talking about it and just eat. 
I think to, to accent any kind of cooking you do, you need a stock. Now we we do it. Going to do a chicken stock for you. We've taken the chicken bones, chicken backs, and we've browned them off till they're golden brown. Then from this point, you can just add water to it now and cover it, or you can get more taste out of it by adding carrots. And you can see we use the peelings of the carrots here. We can put celery into it, and just use the tops. So use the use the bottom, the root of the celery that you would ordinarily throw away, not use. Uh, put onions in it. The skin of the onion gives it a nice tone and color, plus the onion taste. You put garlic, and you can use whole cloves of garlic, or you can use garlic leaves or whatever. And it's it's nice to fill the pot up. Don't put it over full like I just did. But you cover this with water, and you bring it to a boil and let it simmer. Now, if you want to, you can reduce that by not adding water to it and leaving it on a nice simmer, and it'll make you a gelatin. It'll make you a glaze. Or you can just keep adding water and cook it for 24 hours and get this wonderful taste that'll just make everything you cook so much better. Oh. Just bring it to a ball and let it simmer. A gumbo is a very emotional thing for me because there are so many times that I remember eating gumbo that are memorable times in my life. Um, I'll try to relate some of those to you as we go along, but let's get to cooking. The first thing we got to do is you got to season and brown the chicken off. Now, uh, it's important to season every step of the way. I mean, everything you do, if you want uh, what you're cooking to have multiple of tastes or to have a taste constantly changing as you eat it and with each bite, and if you want the last bite to be as good or better than the first one, you, you've got to season every step of the way. And this is what you see us doing. First, we season the chicken. Now we're going to put some on the flour that's going to go in the chicken. Now, my philosophy is that you don't want to take something as bland as flour and put it on the on the, the surface of chicken because you're going to just take away from the taste. Now, it won't make a great deal of difference. But the fact is, is that if you add seasoning to the flour and you've already seasoned the chicken, it'll make a difference to the good. In other words, it'll make it even just a little bit better and help those taste change happen. You want to heat the oil until it's about 375 degrees because you want it really hot. What we're doing here is browning the chicken off. You don't want to cook it. It don't have to be cooked. You want to take it and get it a good golden brown color. You know, I remember at times in my life when when I was uh, when I was gone in high school and and my friends and I used to uh, go to my uncle's service station, an all night restaurant in Opelousas, Louisiana. And I mean, one of the things we had was gumbo. One of the, one of the things we could afford because at the time you could get gumbo for a dollar seventy five or dollar fifty a whole bowl. And I mean, it was two or three o'clock in the morning. You had been out all night with your girl and, you know, you ran out of money and you could go over there and just get a big bowl of gumbo for a dollar and a half. Here we're browning the chicken off and we turn it over. And you see what you want is that just you, you putting taste on the chicken by browning it. You're giving it, you put the skin down first into the skillet and you, you get the fat off of the skin into the, into the oil by browning it off. But you also add dimension to the taste by making the nuttiness of the flour, or browning the flour, which makes a nutty taste to it. And so what we're doing is throughout making this gumbo, you'll see us do things to add to the taste. Now, the, the most important thing probably in my head to the taste of gumbo is the roux. And a roux is flour and oil Big that's fits. cooked at a high temperature until it retains a color. Now, see, what we've done here, we brown the chicken off. And we left the bottom dregs from browning the chicken, all the little pieces of flour and all the fat from the chicken that went into the oil. We, we tried to leave that into the bottom of the skillet because we're accenting the taste. Now, we're adding flour to it and we're taking the flour that we used to dip the chicken in, the seasoned flour, and add it to it. You can see the little seasonings in there. I mean, you can see the, the red pepper and the black pepper and so on. Now, you, you see constantly building taste on top of taste at different points to make those tastes just constantly change and to me that's what a great gumbo is now making the roux is a is an intricate really important part because if you burn this flour and oil if you get it, it too dark or too black it's going to be bitter and once it's bitter you can forget it i mean it's gone but it, it is it's also true. 
the key to the taste of it. Now, when it's a color brown like it is now, it's going to have a nutty taste and it's going to have an influence, but not as great. And it's going to thicken because of the color. Now, when you get a darker brown, it's going to thicken less and it's going to have more of an in, a taste influence on it. So what I'm saying to you is that this part, watch carefully, and this part, try to duplicate as much as you can. Now, see, we're getting, see the color just changed. Now we're getting darker. It's almost like a, it's kind of like a red brown. Now I want to stop the color. I want to stop the cooking process. So I'm adding onions and bell pepper and celery to it, and I've shut off the fire. And I'm also going to add, now I've got seasoning in it. I've got the, uh, the, the, the seasoned mixture that was in the flour along with the onions and bell pepper and celery. Now you can just smell this. I mean, the smell is just awesome. But what I've done, I've taken bland flour and oil that I've already cooked the chicken into that has a chicken taste, and I've combined the taste together to give me a just incredible, strong taste to add to my gumbo. And it, it, I've got the juice of the bell pepper, the juice of the onions, and the seasoning in this with the nutty taste of the flour. Now, when I'm gonna add this to the stock, and you can see how that stock turned out really nice and rich with a, a little brown color to it. Now I'm gonna start adding the roux to it. Now this roux has, is the only thing that's gonna be everywhere in this gumbo. See as I add it to it, so it starts dissipating and little pieces running all over. Now as I whisk it, it's gonna become a part of that juice, a part of the stock. And that part is gonna be in every spoonful. So what I've taken is I've taken onions, bell pepper, and celery, and I've taken a mixture of herbs and spices, and I've taken flour and oil and turned it into the greatest influence in this gumbo. I mean, the greatest influence it has because it's now everywhere. As this boils, the flour is dissipated and become a part of the gumbo. Now I want to build the taste of chicken. And so I'm adding the chicken that I've browned off to it and the particles that are nuttiness that's on the surface of the chicken and a little bit of seasoning that's on the surface is going to also get into the gumbo and add to the taste. And see, what I'm doing is I'm building dimensions and taste, building stages of taste to it. And it's just got to continue. Now, we're going to add the sausage to it. Now the, uh, the sausage has a smokiness. I mean, a smokiness that is going to come in after the after you've taken a bite and you swallow, you're going to feel the smokiness in it and you're going to feel the pepper in it. Now, we're going to add onions and bell pepper and celery another time. Now, see, we've got some that's already cooked into the flour and oil or into the root. Now, they're going to have a taste and texture of their own. Now, we're adding more to it. We're adding more onions and bell pepper and celery fresh again to it to give it a crunchiness. So to give it that second and third and tenth dimension in taste. We're going to add fresh garlic and we've added more herbs and spices to it because right in here, I checked it, I tasted it and I felt like it needed more seasoning. Now, the one thing he didn't add was shrimp, you know, regular shrimp, like, you know, the fresh shrimp that you peel or dried shrimp. I don't know why he didn't use shrimp, but I have to have my shrimp. All that other stuff, I don't consider to need it in a gumbo, okra and oysters and all that, but this gumbo is so far is perfect other than he did not add any shrimp and I don't understand it. Well, what do you have to do at this point is bring it to a boil and let it come to a nice rapid simmer. And when that happens, yep. an oil is going to start forming on the surface. Now this is the oil that the flour is released when you made the root. In other words, the flour can only hold so much oil, so it releases some. So this is part of making a gumbo you have to stop and skim it. And if you let it roll, like you see this simmer rolling, and then the oil is gonna collect on one side of the pan, and then you just take it and just scoop it right off. And see, you have the roux, that's that's a brown color, and you notice that at some point it got started to get black after you put the vegetables in. Now that's an artificial thing when you see it start to get black, because once you put it with the stock, you can see how it's still just a rich, really nice brown color to it. I'm telling you, this is, oh, I'm going to taste this. Mm, that looks good. God, this is good. All it's got to do now is just simmer. A true it's authentic a basic it's gumbo. gumbo. You can just see all the taste in it. Be a bowl of potato salad, put some rice on it, and pour the gumbo to it.
No Cajun table is complete without its own set of condiments. Everybody does their own. Uh, you have pickled pepper vinegars, you have pepper vinegars, you have Creole mustards, you have mustard sauces, and it just goes on and on, all kind of pepper sauces. They're wonderful to add to the food. In closing, I'd like to say to you that get your own pepper vinegars. Get your own table condiments when you're doing Cajun. We appreciate y'all joining us. We hope you had a good time. And remember, if somebody serves you something and it don't taste good, it's not Cajun. <laughs> well, he had a point. Now, there's a few things that he did differently. I'm going to start with the jambalaya. But you guys heard what he said about Creole versus Cajun. You know, he said some things that I wasn't aware of. Uh, you can tell that he's Cajun. You can hear you can hear it all through his his accent, his voice, everything, every word he says, honey. You can tell, and you can tell he know how to cook and eat good. So the jambalaya, the one thing I would have done uh, would brown the sausage first, as well as the chicken. But he didn't do that either time. And I would have also added some shrimp to my jambalaya, but he didn't use shrimp in the jambalaya or the gumbo, but they both looked good. He had a lot of flavor. And when he was saying how the bottom, when he was browning everything and the particles on the bottom of the skillet, you know, that's how my grandfather taught me. That's how he taught me to make a gravy. You don't need flour to make a gravy because if you just put a little seasoning on your meat and brown it real good, those particles will come off of that meat. And all you need to do is add a little water and it will thicken on its own. So he was absolutely right about that. Now the gumbo, I normally just, you know, season my chicken. I, well, I've been using um, skinless boneless thighs. Now my grandfather, he taught me to cook it always using a hen. He liked to use a hen because he said they were a little tougher and would cook up better in the gumbo and not fall apart. And he's absolutely right. I'm okay with having the chicken to sort of break down into the gumbo juices and, you know, just be in every bite. But using a hen or something like that is, is much better for you. Now, I would just sear the chicken or the hen or whatever, but this chef, he actually put some flour on it and fried it up for a few minutes. He didn't cook it, but he just put flour on it and fried it. And well, you know, that's another way of searing because he didn't cook it. I've never done it that way, but I am definitely going to try that. And again, he did not use any shrimp, dried shrimp. My grandfather, I mean, he lived by dried shrimp and the gumbo growing up there in Beaumont, close to Lake Charles and all of that. Port Arthur, um, we always had dried shrimp in our gumbo as well as regular shrimp. Uh, well, he would call them green shrimp, the kind that you get and you peel the, the, the uh, scale off or whatever. And I also like to put crabs in my gumbo. He didn't do that. So, but that gumbo looked good. It looked seasoned. He seasoned it well. I like the way he made his roux. The, when he fried that chicken a little bit or seared it or whatever, he poured a lot of that grease off and then he put the flour in there to make the roux. So it had those seasonings already built up in it. So I know it was flavorful, flavorful. And then he took some of the Trinity, the um, is it onions, celery, and bell peppers, and put that in there and brought that together. Now, I tried to do that once, put onions in my roux, you know, when, when I was making it. And I don't know, it was still too hot and it burnt the onions. They turned like really black. And I had to start over and make an entire roux again. So I hadn't done it that way in a while. But I will. The next time I make a gumbo, I'm going to try his recipe. But this video, when it popped up, it made me think about my grandfather. It brought me back to my days of living and growing up in Beaumont, Texas, my hometown. Uh, all of the good Cajun and Creole food we would eat. And he broke it down to me, told me the difference between Cajun and Creole. I would never stop eating those types of dishes. I love them. I love spices. And I will be trying his version of making gumbo as well as jambalaya. Now, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something from it. And if you've never made a gumbo, make sure you try it. And to me, I like, like I said, on his gumbo, it was simple and basic. The only thing I would add would be some shrimps and maybe crab legs. I don't put okra in gumbo. That's not meant for a gumbo as far as I'm concerned because it's a little slimy. I don't do the oysters and all of that other stuff. You know, I know people, you know, lobster tails and all that. That's good, but I wasn't raised making gumbo that way. So 
I'll stick with the simple, basic, traditional gumbo. And it's oh, so delicious. All right, guys. Thank you for watching this. I hope you enjoyed it. And you know your girl will be back with another video real soon. See y'all later.